Good evening and welcome to the American Psychiatric Association's Health Equity Webinar entitled Looking Beyond. My name is Dr. Regina James and I'm the Chief for the Division of Diversity and Health Equity and Deputy Medical Director here at the APA. The goal of these webinars are essentially twofold. First, we'd like to bring education and awareness, which can lead to, number two, dialogue and discussion about key information and key activities that are impacting marginalized and minoritized communities. We call it looking beyond because we want to look beyond sort of the single disciplinary approach and really bring in a multidisciplinary lens to really address how can we attack these issues surrounding mental health inequities. So tonight, our esteemed panel will revisit a report that was produced by the Department of Labor uh, under the leadership of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He was at that time the Assistant Secretary of Labor under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. And this report that was developed uh, in the Department of Labor is titled the Negro Family, the Case for National Action. But most of us know it as the Moynihan Report. Our experts tonight will explore the impact of this report on psychiatric practice today. Now in the report, the authors ascertain that the decline of the black nuclear family significantly impeded progress toward economic and social equality. And that this dysfunctional family structure and culture are the roots of black poverty. So this premise that black poverty was rooted in a dysfunctional family structure shifted the focus away from the impact of longstanding historical laws, policies, and cultural practices that impeded economic and social progress in the Black community. So how is all of this related to mental health inequities and psychiatric practice today? Well, this is where I'm going to leave it to our experts. I'm gonna hand over the virtual mic to our guest, but beforehand, let me introduce each one of them. Um, our moderator for this evening is Dr. Walter E. Wilson, Jr., a native New Yorker from Brooklyn. He devotes his time and effort and expertise as a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist at Health Family Care Incorporated, a federally qualified health center in Covington, Kentucky. And he's also the chair for the American Psychiatric Association's Minority Mental Health and Health Disparities Council. Our guests include Dr. Jonathan Shepard, who's a board certified child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist. He serves as the Chief Clinical Officer for the DC Department of Behavioral Health, and he is the President of the Board of Directors of a nonprofit called Black Mental Health Alliance, and he serves as the Chair of the APA's Black Caucus. And we'll round out our special guest with Dr. Brian Smedley. Dr. Smedley is an Equity Scholar and Senior Fellow at the Urban Institute. He's co-founder and executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. He's vice president and director, he was vice president and director of the Health Policy Institute of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies in Washington, DC. And many of you may remember that he was the study director for landmark IOM reports, including unequal treatment, confronting racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. So before I hand the virtual mic over to Dr. Wilson, let me just briefly set the stage for 1965 in the United States. So as they take on this discussion, have this backdrop in your mind. It's 1965, a time of intense social and political activities. You have the Vietnam War going on, the Watts riots of 1965, the voting rights were just signed into law, and the previous year, the civil rights law was signed into law. So with this landscape, the Moynihan Report goes from this internal document to a report that is made public. And with that, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Wilson. 
Great, thank you, Dr. James. And so um, first, I'm, I'm excited to be able to moderate such an important discussion, uh, one that I think is gonna be, um, it's obviously not only timely, but um, I think it's very nuanced uh, as you, as you know, we've all read the Moynihan report, and and if this if you're watching this is your first time hearing about the Moynihan report, you know I definitely recommend that you read it, uh, read through it thoroughly, and and um, kind of the uh, just just take in what Moynihan actually talked about um, as we kind of discuss this. And so um, I'm excited to be able to share the virtual stage with with Dr. Smedley uh, as well as Dr. Shepard, who will be joining us uh, momentarily. Um, Dr. James gave a, a very, very good overview. You know, I think that, you know, the context of the time matters, right? And that's why it makes it such a important conversation for us now to see where we are in 2024, as far as addressing some of the things that Moynihan identified in his report that uh, may still be pointed to us today. Uh, and also the controversies, right? Where are we as far as some of the controversies and how we feel about that, uh, you know, several decades later. And so. Um, I'm very excited to be able to, to chat a little bit about it, a little bit about Moynihan, a little bit more about Moynihan. Uh, you know, he was an academic scholar. He was tapped to do the Moynihan Report by Lyndon Johnson because um, he had a background in looking at poverty and urban life. And, um, you know, he was a Democrat. He was very, uh, he, was, he was actually a, kind of ahead of his time in terms of some of the policies that he uh, tried to implement and, and, and pushed for. Um, as a, an ambassador to the UN uh, for the uh, United States, he was um, he just did some some pretty pretty groundbreaking work with uh, just some of the ideas that that he wanted to push. Uh, but he had a lot of respect uh, in uh, in Washington. Um, in addition to not only working with Kennedy and and Lyndon B. Johnson, he also worked with Nixon. And a lot of people didn't understand that, right? Nixon and, and uh, his entire cabinet had very different. Uh, kind of views, especially politically, than Moynihan. Moynihan was a six foot five, kind of very flamboyant um, politician who was very uh, outgoing and, and very outspoken about a lot of different things. And um, but because of that, and because of his focus on uh, the war on poverty, as well as uh, what he talked about in the Moynihan report, he I think he brought a some 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 rounded uh, rounded discussion to to that administration. Uh, but again, of course, there were there were some things in there that were quite quite controversial and I'm looking forward to, to chatting about it. So uh, without further ado, what, I'll, what I will do is we'll give um, Dr. Smedley and Dr. Shepard when he joins us a little bit of time just for some remarks and, and some opening remarks regarding the, uh, the Moynihan report. And, and so, uh, so I'll pass the, the baton to you, Dr. Smedley and, and uh, go ahead and, and talk a little bit about your, your overview. Well, thank you, Dr. Wilson, and uh, thanks to the APA for uh, having this important conversation. Uh, strong feelings, of course, on many sides, many different dimensions of this report, but it's important that we have the conversation uh, because today we're in a as important a, an era politically, I would argue, in terms of racial injustice and what our society is willing to do about it. What is the role of research? uh in helping us to understand the dimensions of the challenge and more importantly what is our agenda going forward so the moynihan report did a number of things that were important it named racism uh people forget that uh, moynihan was very clear about the role of racism and discrimination uh in terms of its uh the depth of its uh pathology uh for the entire society really but particularly for those uh, racially minoritized populations. Um, but from a mental health perspective, I think the most important impact of the Moynihan report was contributing to a broader cultural narrative uh, of dysfunction uh, that affected how mental health professionals uh, affected their practice. We all know uh, that, their, that providers um, in any clinical field bring a host of attitudes, biases, to clinical encounters, some explicit, uh, some implicit or automatically activated. The Moynihan Report, unfortunately, uh, despite its courage in naming racism, uh, located the problem, of course, in the black family uh, and failed to address the, the broader societal structures, economic, political, criminal justice systems and structures that created uh, the crisis that black families faced at the time, and of course, in many respects, uh, is deepening and worse. 
The Moynihan Report also failed to acknowledge the historic reality uh, that throughout our nation's history, uh, black families had been torn apart, whether in the roughly 200 year period of uh, slavery, whether in the 100 years of uh, Jim Crow segregation that followed through policies such as uh, the black codes, which uh, uh, incarcerated, uh, uh, took uh, black men off the streets and incarcerated them uh, for no crimes uh, more significant than things like vagrancy, convict leasing, another form of slavery by uh, 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 having these convicts perform labor uh, for no gain of, of their own. So uh, this history continues through today's criminal justice practices and policies uh, that have distorted and, uh, and in many ways have created uh, chaotic circumstances for black families that are struggling uh, to, uh, uh, for family structure. So uh, the report did, did some important things. I think it's important to acknowledge that now in today's climate, uh, which is, I would argue, uh, in, in a deeper crisis in terms of our ability to come together to understand the challenges for the entire nation and for the globe, really, of racial injustice and understanding the structures uh, and systems that help perpetuate uh, the kinds of inequities that many mental health pr practitioners see uh, on the back end, which is the consequences of that kind of racism uh, on individual patients, their families, uh, their communities, and the entire society. I'll, I'll have more that, that I want to uh, argue on other issues that the report tees up, uh, and of course, some of the ways that the report continued to distort uh, black families, but I'll, I'll save that for our for our discussion. Absolutely, a discussion that's going to be rich. And so thank you so much, Dr. Smelly. And right on time, Dr. Shepard, perfect timing. Uh, Dr. Smelly just, uh, just gave his remarks. We had uh, Dr. James, of course, uh, give the overview. I gave a little bit more of an overview. And so, you know, take your time, settle in, um, and we'll go ahead and if you're ready, we'll we'll go ahead and give you give you the floor, Doctor Doctor Shepard, to chat a little bit about your your general thoughts of. Um, the all right. Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to see you all. Uh, those who I can see and those who I'm not able to see. Uh, this is such an important uh, discussion uh, today. And uh, so glad to be a part of it. Uh, glad that uh, I'm a part of the American Psych Psych Psychiatric Association. Uh, I do uh, say that uh, proudly. And uh, I am glad to be a part of an organization uh, that uh, is attempting to get it right. Uh, uh, there are no perfect people, no perfect organizations. And so uh, uh, I want to make sure that I say that. I uh, thank all those who are participants and those who are part of the planning uh, of this. Um, let me just say this. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, a particular uh, report that came out in 1965. And uh, I'm sure you, uh, those who have not read it uh, by now or didn't get the brief overview, uh, we'll be sharing some of the uh, tenets of that particular uh, report. Uh, one of the things I do want to, and I don't plan to talk long here, uh, one of the things I just want to say is that these reports serve as a reminder of where we have come from. They also serve as a reminder of how much work we still have to do. Uh, I think that's what really blows my mind, is that when you read something from 1965, and I'm still in, well, we all are part of 2024, and you look at the difference between the years and how some things are just eerily similar. Uh, that really strikes me, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it lets me know that there's work still to be done. Uh, we have not arrived, uh, despite what some people may think. Uh, there's still work to be done. And so uh, that's where I wanna hang my hat on today is what work uh, are we going to do uh, to continue to move this train forward? Uh, this is not going to be a, a discussion to beat up on people or to beat up on what we have not done 
or the beat up of even on the APA or things like that. But we want to we want to sound the alarm and we want to hopefully energize um, the membership and those who are listening today so that they'll continue to do the work in whatever area or, uh, of the country or even those who may be outside this country to continue this work toward equality and equity, especially when it comes to mental health. Uh, I'll start right there, Dr. Wilson. That's perfect. Yeah, and, and thank you for those comments. And and you struck some. You struck a chord with me on that one simply because uh, when I was reading it, I was surprised at how how much of what was going on then applies. It's, it's still things that we're struggling with now. Like you said, we have not arrived, right? We have not arrived, and so. Um, but it is a great, great reminder, which is why I think these things are important for us to look back and say, okay, well, these are these are still things that we need to do. Um, and sometimes we need that that renewed energy uh, in, in that fashion. And so, um, and just for those watching the webinar, the kind of the way that we're uh, structuring this is we're going to uh, go through some some questions with, uh, I'm going to present some questions to our panelists uh, who, who will both take an opportunity to answer those. But during that time, you know, we want to hear from you. And so right after that will be a uh, question and answer from, you know, individuals who are who are watching. Uh, so feel free. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We can go ahead and put it in the chat. I'll be able to, to read them from the chat. Um, but start start piling them in there. Any questions that pop up as, as we're going through maybe the next 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, you know, answering some some panelists' uh, questions. So feel free to to start adding your own questions regarding uh, for for our panelists as well. We'll have a question and answer session. And so, um, so without further ado, what we'll we'll start with a, a question, and I'll come uh, to uh, to Dr. Smedley first with this question. Then uh, Dr. Shepard will have an opportunity to to follow up. And the first question is uh, kind of pertaining to impact on policy. One hand reports impact on policy. Um, and so what, in what ways did the Moynihan Report influence mental health policies, particularly those affecting marginalized communities? Are there any direct lines we can draw from the report's recommendations to current mental health practices? And Dr. Smedley, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Wilson. So I think what's important about the report is it's not at all a policy prescription. Uh, Moynihan himself said that that was not his goal. Uh, it says that there needs to be a coordinated federal effort, a point that I want to get back to in a minute. Uh, but the, uh, the ironic uh, thing about if you locate the challenge as a family issue, why not allocate resources uh, to solve that problem, such as mental health uh, and be behavioral health resources? Uh, of course, we have disinvested uh, from mental health resources uh, in terms of our public uh, expenditures. Uh, and these uh, have become, you know, the, the very solutions uh, that I think um, are today social scientists would uh, endorse, you know, doing things like uh, improving access to needed mental health services by uh, federal subsidies for the costs, uh, particularly for uh, low income communities and making those services uh, more readily and easily available uh, in communities in culturally congruent ways, but we have disinvested uh, from those kinds of investments. Um, we know that uh, there are programs that incentivize uh, providers to get into underserved communities that um, desperately need more resources to expand those programs so that we can align uh, behavioral and mental health providers uh, in communities where they're needed. So. Uh, these are the kinds of solutions that I think I, I think are called for in the coordinated federal effort that uh, Moynihan concludes his report with, uh, because it that's where we need the leadership, that's where we have the resources uh, and the opportunity to make the very investments that would uh, address um, the some of the challenges that that Moynihan pointed to. Absolutely. Dr. Shepard, I'll, I'll come to you with that same question. Yeah, you know, I, I as if you see me looking off to the side for those who are watching, but I, I'm having I have the report pulled up here, and there's certain things I had um, uh, make sure that I had identified. And this is interesting in the report uh, how um, Moyahan had uh, started out with going all the way back to the 1700s. Uh, and then looking at uh, 
each century. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, as to why he lays that out uh, that way. Um, for me, when you talk about how does the re recommendations, um, what what type of recommendations can we draw uh, to, our, to our current mental health practices? I, I look at the history of, of this country and I look at the history of uh, psychiatry and you know, it it really shows me how we have evolved in some of our practices. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I wonder if our practices really handle the trauma that we as Black people have suffered. That's where I, I that's why I keep looking back at this history. Like, man, you keep going back and back and, um, I don't know if our current mental health practices really address the trauma that uh, Black people have endured from the various centuries uh, that they have been here on the United States of America. And so again, I would challenge those who, we're the experts, we are the people who should be most uh, readily available to handle the various uh, 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 traumas that people uh, have endured, um, you know, that really, um, that may not be the answer you were looking for, Dr. Wilson, but I'll be honest with you, you know, I I'm looking at what the current mental health practices are, um, you know, and what conclusions can I draw, recommendations, you know, that one of the recommendations that I would have is that we really have to be sensitive to understand that there are layers of layers and layers of trauma that have occurred that we all have endured. Uh, and even if, you know, people say they can't remember their ancestors who's, who may have came over uh, on the slave ships and things like that, that's okay. But let's think about the financial uh, traumas that we have endured due to uh, only being called three-fifths of a person and not being able to uh, have proper health care, not able really to get proper employment. Uh, all these things are just such a heavy weight. And you wonder why uh, we have Black men who are so angry, Black women who are so angry and depressed. Um, uh, I would challenge us uh, to make sure that in our recommendations, for current mental health practices that we are sensitive to the history of what has happened and to make sure that we are addressing uh, the traumas uh, that unfortunately linger on. Uh, I wasn't there 200 years ago. None, none of us were, but as I read it, I felt it. That's a tremendous point. Yeah, I, and you know, it's interesting when I'm, when I'm sitting with patients and you talk about kind of how where we are in mental health in our mental system and whether or not we're approaching trauma the right way. You know, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm educating my families around complex trauma, right? Of course, our, you know, our notion of PTSD and, um, and trauma that's in DSM-5 is more kind of combat based and, and you know, it, it comes from that type of history. And it's not, you know, it's not necessarily, um, we're not necessarily equipped diagnostically yet you know, as far as diagnoses to, to address complex trauma in children, right? And just to double down on your point, we're definitely not equipped diagnostically to address generational trauma, right? And so, you know, I think we need terminology. I think we need um, a different framework of, of looking at, you know, what was going on then, what was going on centuries ago. And, you know, like Dr. Smedley uh, mentioned in his kind of his, his opening remarks, you know, Moynihan does talk about how racial discrimination and slavery have led to what's going on. Um, but even again, even farther, you know, to where we are in 2024, sometimes I think we forget that, right? We still, we still forget that we still don't attribute things that are happening in the black community to slavery, discrimination, some of the things that he mentioned, um, because clinically it does matter, right? How do we address those things? And so that's, those are, those are great remarks, uh, Dr. Shepard, I appreciate that. So that was definitely the answer we were looking for. That was very thought thoughtful. Um, and kind of, you know, piggybacking off of that a little bit, and, and Dr. Shepard, I'll, I'll come to you with this question first, and then 
than to Dr. Smidley, um, you know, just on the, the issue of stigma and stereotypes. Um, and uh, so the Morning Hand Report has been criticized for reinforcing certain stereotypes. From your perspective, how have these perceptions contributed to the stigma around mental health in Black communities? And what can mental health professionals do to counteract this? And so I'll just hit you with that heavy one, Dr. Shepard. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's heavy. It ain't too heavy. I can lift it. Uh, let, me <laughs> let me tell you, the stigma is out there. Uh, there is such an important sentence, and I, I laugh at it because I wonder if people really believe it. In chapter one, it says the Negro African Revolution is rightly regarded as the most important domestic event of the post-war period in the United States. Now, that statement right there, uh, I want to know that people really believe that. Now, people might say, well, what do they got to do with stick with Dr. Shepard? You off track. No, I, I'm right on track. I know exactly where I'm at. Because... If people really believe that statement and held it to be true, then some of the stigmas that we in that we encounter when I walk into a store and I may be dressed, I might even be dressed like Dr. Wilson. He got the tie going today. And people are following me because they are scared that I'm going to steal something from their store. That's as bad as when I was dressed in my scrubs coming out of Universal Illinois Hospital. Yeah, I'm going to put them on blast. And the police came and made me sit on the curb because I thought I was the one stealing for the vending machines. You must be kidding. So what are the stigmas? The stigmas are that, yes, they are there. They're real. Um, I just gave one earlier in my last response about that Black people are angry. You're right. We are angry. And we have a right to be angry but we don't always act out in that anger because it's been repressed. Um, and so, so, so many of us sometimes don't even know how to be able to even exercise our frustration, anger, agitation correctly. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, you know, these perceptions that um, black men, when you come in that, that, you know, uh, or I'll say this, uh, I was going to say black men are always angry, but also what, what I'm also seeing is that uh, the narrative is shifted to where if a black person brings up a point of, well, you know, I wasn't treated right. You know, that was uh, 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 that was something that was a microaggression. I'm hearing people now, oh, you always looking for the microaggression. Oh, you always you always looking for something. No, I'm not always looking for anything. I'm recognizing that these things are true. And let me tell you what's very frustrating I'm in right here is that when people bring these things up and they are slighted or they're swept under the rug or they're told that, you know what, get over it. No, you're okay. That didn't really happen. And once that continues to happen, think about it. You know, you're, you're, you're thinking about a people whose wives, black men who saw their wives raped by white owners and they were told to deal with it, had to have their children, had to be able to um, uh, know that people were utilizing their children, their selves. Uh, and we see this and we've heard about this. We read about this. And so now you tell us that what well, we speak up that, no, this didn't really happen. This, you know, just be quiet. These are perceptions that still permeate throughout our society today. It may not be as uh, uh, vulgar as what I was just describing, uh, but these things are still uh, permeating through our society today. So uh, I can understand why people are criticizing it for certain stereotypes, because these stereotypes actually do uh, remain. Dr. Smelly. I, so first, I just have to say, I so appreciate what you're saying, Dr. Shepard, that's you are spot on. And um, uh, it, this, of course, is why that narrative has been so pernicious, uh, that uh, unfortunately, that report helped to uh, reinforce. Um, the other 
stereotypes that the report helped reinforce. The absent black father uh, is a consistent narrative in the in that report. Now, I do not believe that the CDC's behavioral risk factor surveillance survey was in the field during Moynihan's era, but that research shows us that black fathers are as involved, if not more involved than white fathers daily in their children's lives in terms of homework, uh, chores. Um, this is the research evidence. Moynihan speculates on what he thinks is the appropriate uh, family structure and has no research to back up the notion that black men uh, and black fathers are deeply involved regardless of, of family structure uh, or, or, or the traditional family structure that Moynihan envisioned. Other stereotypes that he reinforced, the report of course is so dripping with patriarchy. Uh, the notion that uh, women-led families, women-led communities, women-led societies are somehow deficient. There are matriarchal societies across the globe and they are highly effective. So patriarchy is a Western concept uh, that is part of the process of colonizing the mindset of uh, people across the globe. And um, we are, or should be about the business of decolonizing uh, mental health. And uh, that begins with this kind of scrutiny. Um, so uh, yeah, let's, let's deconstruct those stereotypes because we have the evidence to show uh, that not only is that not true, uh, but they have been harmful. Uh, and um, that mindset, that narrative has been harmful to everybody. We need to cleanse uh, ourselves of that Western notion of what families, what societies, what communities should look like. Yes, great points. And then, you know, it, that's where I think in, in my reading uh, of the Moynihan Report is, is what uh, I kind of oppose the most, right? The idea that our communities led uh, by black women are the reason why uh, the, you know, his idea was that the, you know, the, those com our communities were failing. Um, and Dr. Dr. Shepard said something in our prep session that I'll bring up here that I thought was important, which was, you know, who is he to set that standard, right? I think he got some things right, he got this wrong. And so, um, you know, this was one of those areas where it's like, like you mentioned, you know, that way, you know, patriarchy is a Western standard. Um, there are, you know, are societies that work very well that are matriarchies and there are different ways to do it than the way we do it in the West. Um, and just because the black community may, you know, may have been and may still be uh, more of a, of a matriarchy does not mean that's, that's, that should be considered automatic uh, dysfunction at default. And so, or by default. And so um, those are, those are great, great, great points. Great, great points. Could I, if I could just add to that, the thing yeah. that Moynihan also ignored is that people who get married tend to be people with higher levels of education and income. They're, they're ready to be married. And unfortunately, black people were, have been systematically denied those kinds of opportunities, educational opportunities, income, occupational, wealth building. Um, so uh, there is an economic disincentive simply because of built into our economic structures that Moynihan, of course, didn't recognize as well. But it's important that we, we understand uh, because that truly uh, is one of many keys to family structure. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And so we'll move on to the next question. And so I'll start with you, Dr. Smelly, and then Dr. Shepard, you'll, you'll follow up on this one. Uh, so we'll kind of turn to socioeconomic factors that were discussed in the Moynihan Report. And so um, how did the Moynihan Report address the socioeconomic factors affecting mental health in African-American communities, what gaps in this analysis can we identify today that might inform more effective interventions? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, again, um, Moynihan does not correctly identify racism, particularly structural racism, as the driver of economic inequality between Black and white people. Um, and that includes uh, residential segregation, school segregation, job segregation, um, and understanding that context, understanding that those opportunities have never been afforded uh, to Black families, and particularly, uh, you know, uh, Moynihan implicitly blames 
black men for taking advantage of, of opportunities. Those didn't have historically not existed. Um, so uh, what of course is, is true is that families that are struggling um, income wise have a host of stresses and assaults that they have to deal with from a mental health perspective. One of the lines that I was interested in that, that Moyni had said that, I, that I, I could not quote but agree with is that he points to the fact that uh, black families have been so deeply resilient to deal with those kinds of assaults, to deal with the racism, to deal with the class discrimination, uh, to deal with the job and, and school segregation um, uh, and, and understanding how unfair that is, has to erode the soul. It has to erode the psyche. Uh, he hints at that. Um, and I think that's also what Dr. Shepard is saying is that those are the kinds of trauma, uh, intergenerational trauma that are associated with both racism and economic exploitation, and they have health and mental health consequences. Um, and I, I agree with what you said earlier, Dr. Shepard, we don't know how to deal with that. Uh, we don't know how to deal with that. Sure, I think reparations would be a start. Um, and um, but understanding how to fix the systems and structures that help to per perpetuate these inequities rather than to mitigate them um, is a good place to start, including our mental health systems. Dr. Shepard, floor is yours. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Smutley. Um, again, you know, I, I just love this quoting stuff. Um, uh, this, this, this statement about uh, in the report, it says the impact of unemployment on the Negro on the Negro family. I got a problem with that word. That's why I take a little about the Negro. That's take a little bit of time to get out my mouth. And particularly on the Negro male, is the least understood of all the developments that have contributed to the present crisis. Are you for real? There is little analysis because there has been almost no inquiry. I don't have to stay long with this one. Um, you just said it, Dr. Smedley. And I want everybody knowing here, you know, I am I am a strong proponent of equity. Um, I believe in people should be treated right. But I have to be real. I know that the system is not geared for me to win. In 2024, let's be real. This system that we work in is not geared for a black male to get ahead. It is. It is. It still is not. So when you say that the impact of unemployment on the Negro family is least understood, no, it actually is. It's very well understood. When people came back from the war in World War II, they could not uh, maintain their own families. OK, because of the GI Bill, because of the other things that were uh, 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 set against black people, um, they came back. They were not even given proper medical care for those who had been traumatized through the war and things like that. So how are they to provide for their families when many of them went off to a country to fight and win victory and their own country turned their backs on them? They have to, we have to understand the system today. And that's why I was said my, in my opening comments. It's so amazing how so we can look back in history and see how these certain practices are still going on today. Yes, there are some people who have escaped out of that system. Absolutely. But I would be stupid to say that even though I've been able to achieve a to become a physician, but I, I, I am no fool. I know that the system is not here to advance me. I am thankful that I have certain people who support me, parents, friends, and those people like that who put the right values inside of me. But when you say that you don't know what's why the impact of unemployment, because the system is rigged against you. It's not meant for you to win. So that, those are great points. And um, and, a, and a quick follow up to those those points. And I, because now, uh, you know, when you read the Moynihan report, he does recognize he does talk about he, he, he kind of was misguided in his understanding of what specifically was going on with the family, especially when it comes to socioeconomic factors that impacted it. He did talk about, you know, there was a part in the Moynihan report where he talks about um, it's not fair. It's not enough for us to 
give the black community civil rights, right? Give, you know, kind of almost, he, he used kind of the, the dichotomy between freedom and equality. Um, to give that freedom of, okay, well now, you know, we're going to get rid of Jim Crow, we're going to get rid of all these things without one acknowledging that there are factors that we had mentioned before that, that have led us to this point, but also the idea that you can't destroy an entire community for centuries and then just say, there you are, here are your opportunities. And so, um, you know, he felt like the actual, uh, that the government, if they're going to be involved, should do good things. And so, um, do you think that was kind of his way of, and it's more anecdotal, do you feel like this, that was kind of his way of saying, we do need to address, I do recognize that there were some, there are some structural things that have, that have caused these issues. Um, and we do need to address those. It's not enough to say, you know, the black, black community, you know, go ahead and catch up now. You have all the opportunities when we know that you can't just, you, you know, you can't put, them at a, put us at a disadvantage only to kind of unleash us to opportunities um, without any help from the, you know, from government assistance, obviously, welfare reform and all that stuff came a little bit later. But do you think that was his way of saying, we do need to, there needs to, we need to step in to help the community catch up equity. Um, and was that enough for him to say, or did he not, did he need to, did he need to step a little bit further or, or be a little bit stronger in that area? And I'm just one more opinion. Is that directed to me, uh, Dr. Wilson? Or... Yeah, really anyone. Just... <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's, it's important to put um, the Moynihan Report in its historical context in 1965. Um, you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson was beginning to launch this great society, War on Poverty. Um, he got, you know, obviously uh, he did the, by getting in, enmeshed deeper in Vietnam, that took his political energy and attention away from addressing poverty. I think Moynihan was trying to tee up um, issues of racism. He wouldn't, wouldn't have said racism at the time and poverty um, for the Johnson administration. But um, of course, we know what happened. The, the, the US got more deeply enmeshed in this war. Um, people did not see the connections that Dr. King was trying to, to to show between the domestic racism and um, and this international um, internationalism that served no purpose but to you know kill black and brown young men um, you know um, it, it it's interesting to think about what would have happened or what could have happened um, it, had there been uh, more of a federal effort but of course it was misguided. Um, uh, because of Moynihan's emphasis, if there had been a, an emphasis on correcting the federal government's historical wrongs in, for example, perpetuating segregation, perpetuating hospital segregation, uh, perpetuating school segregation, um, uh, and, and offering some sort of repair, uh, that would have been the logical conclusion of a correctly structured Moynihan report. <laughs> Absolutely. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Shepard, or you're good? <laughs> good. All right, and so we'll move on to um, talk a little bit more about uh, the, the family structure and kind of some things around the morning here report. We kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, and so I'll start with you, Dr. Shepard, and then we'll, we'll go to Dr. Smedley on this one. And so uh, the report famously focused on the structure of black families as, we, as we've discussed previously. How should modern psychiatry approach the discussion of family dynamics in a culturally sensitive way that avoids pathologizing marginalized communities. Yeah, so if you look at the, again, the report, <clears throat> if, you, if you go under chapter two, it says, at the heart of the deterioration of the fabric of the Negro society is the deterioration of the Negro family. Um. It is the fundamental source of the weakness of the Negro community at the present time. Hmm. Uh, it also mentions that the, um, uh, uh, the uh, it talks about the family as the basic social unit of American life. Uh, and I can agree with that statement. Uh, I don't agree with the statement that the deterioration uh, of the fabric of the Negro society is the, is the deterioration of the Negro family. 
Uh, I can agree with it because people ripped it apart. It wasn't because they wanted to have it ripped apart. Uh, you have to remember, and I, I, I gave some illustrations earlier about how is it that you expect for the basic uh, social, socialization or socializing unit when you come in and you come in and you just rip it apart and you put in, um, uh, you mix in different things. Uh, uh, so what am I saying? Slave owners who came into black families and they raped their the black women, uh, those who are male, and then they they had their babies. Um, I mean, I mean, what's happening here? You're literally uh, reshaping, uh, and and you're really traumatizing uh, uh, the the basic fabric of our of our society, and you think that's okay, and you want people to live through that. So, what am I saying to modern society today? You have to understand that these are things that people have remembered and do remember, but then also know that how one's culture uh, uh, defines family may not be how another culture defines it either. I'm not saying it as, as eloquently as I want to. Um, when you think about uh, today's family, and I did some research on this. I had to, I had to speak at a, 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 a at a symposium last year on, on the family. And it was amazing when you look at the structure of the family today versus back in 1965. Uh, so many things have changed. Uh, you have women working uh, in the in the marketplace. Uh, uh, you know, people still want to be married. Uh, but you have less people who think it's necessary to be married. So attitudes shift, mindsets shift. And as a psychiatrist, I have to make sure that I understand the attitudes and the mindsets of the people who I'm working with. What may have worked for the Shepherd household may not work for the Wilson household, even though we Black people. And I need to be okay with that. Just because you have seen what you think is the typical Black family, the Huxtables uh, through the Cosby show, that don't mean that that's how my family worked, even when I did have a father and mother at home. No, we didn't, you know, we didn't do all those things, <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, as a psychiatrist, it would uh, really, uh, I implore you to make sure that you find out how does that family structure work? Um, we are living in a society where men, I'm sorry, women would make more than than the male in the house. 1965, that probably wasn't happening or wasn't happening that much. And let me tell you, for those who are out there, the women, I, I, I can kind of feel, you know, I may not see you, but I can kind of feel your vibe right now. Shepard, there's still equality. There's still disparities out there. So yeah, I hear you, especially if you look at the WNBA versus it. I mean, that's probably the most uh, uh, recent example where the, uh, the 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 equity is has not been there. A woman comes in gets seventy seven thousand dollars a year. A man comes in makes one point some million dollars, uh, playing the same game. Uh, and, and, and even that could work. Even this illustration, the culture, you know, you're still playing the same game, but it's different rules. And so we have to understand that as a physician, we need to be very sensitive to know that. When we walk into a room, we cannot make these assumptions. Uh, even uh, even when we see two parent families, to know that hey, uh, the, the the family structure uh, is one that could be working uh, for them, um, even if they are not even married anymore, even or maybe they were not married, or even their same sex partners. I mean, all of this now is a part of twenty twenty four. Uh, and a lot of stuff you did not see that in 1965. I feel like I'm talking too much now, so I'm going to stop right there. No, never too much. Never too much. Dr. Smelly, you have the floor. I, I would just endorse what Dr. Shepard said. It, we have to understand that what makes a family work is what makes a family work. And families today uh, are, are dealing with different pressures, different struggles. Uh, and so we've got to recognize that families 
can take on all kinds of shapes. They can be extended uh, as long as, you know, our children are growing up in loving, healthy households, as long as there are loving relationships. Uh, these are the things that we all want, but we got to understand that, uh, you know, the, the kinds of uh, the kinds of racism that has infected every aspect of American society uh, disrupts those relationships. And so for psychiatry and any mental health field, uh, you know, of course, understanding uh, the consequences of lifelong experiences of racism uh, compounded by those intergenerational kinds of influences that Dr. Shepard's talking about, you know, we're beginning to understand epigenetics more and understanding how uh, our, our DNA is altered through these kinds of traumatic experiences. And I, I would say we need to have more research understanding uh, uh, these areas and, and particularly uh, understanding consequences for uh, mental health and, and, and physical health. Uh, so we, there's so much that we need to be doing the new research that we need to be funding to understand uh, how to intervene. Exactly right. Great, great points. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on the both of you, you know, just as a child and a psychiatrist, when I think about talking about family dynamics um, in my office, you know, it's, it's you, you mentioned it's I, I think I lean much more on the ideas behind attachment theory than I do anything else, because I think that's a little bit more almost like culture neutral, right? We, we want to make sure that we have a child growing up in a household with healthy adults who can, who can show them how to interact with the world in a healthy way, right? And that leads to healthy families, right? And that can be in, you know, all different wonderful blends, right? That can be a mom and a dad, that can be a dad and a dad, that can be a mom and a mom, right? We need to step outside of the heterosexual norms. Um, and also, you mentioned generationally, right? I see a lot of grandparents. I see a lot of grandparents and moms, grandparents and dads, uh, uncles, cousins. As long as you have those healthy attachments that are teaching you how to interact with the world, um, then we have uh, an environment where a child can be really nurtured. And so, you know, what does, you know, doc, going back to what Dr. Shepard said, you know, what, what one healthy family looks like in a culture may be different from another culture and may be different within cultures, right? We're not all the same. That's exactly right. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's the beautiful thing I, I think about family, um, that it can, it can come in all shapes and sizes and, and, and be very functional and be very effective. And so, um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And just a reminder to those watching, feel free to, to put questions in the chat. I see a couple have come in so far, uh, but we'll be asking a couple more questions and then we're gonna be getting to, uh, to the questions that the audience has. And so uh, feel free to just kind of throw them in the chat there. All right, and so coming back to you, Dr. Smedley, and then follow up with Dr. Shepard, um, we'll talk a little bit about, we, we touched on this a little bit more with the impact on policy, but now focusing a little bit more on the future, right, on policy recommendations. And um, so based on your understanding of the Moynihan Report and its impact, what policy recommendations would you make to improve mental health services for historically marginalized and minoritized communities today? Sure, yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's clear that we've been disinvesting as a, as a nation uh, in terms of our, our health and our mental health not only our, our healthcare infrastructure, mental health care infrastructure, our, our public health infrastructure, uh, we need to restore those investments. Those are gonna be good for everybody clearly, but particularly obviously for those communities that have been uh, marginalized uh, racially um, and, and particularly given the mental health uh, challenges that many communities experience, particularly communities of color uh, during COVID, we saw the dangers, the exposures uh, the risks to families, to communities, uh, when people experience mental health crises and we are poorly prepared in our communities to deal with these needs. I think there's a real uh, mismatch between community need um, and where our mental health care resources are located. Uh, it's no surprise to your viewers that our uh, best and highest quality uh, Health, uh, mental health resources are, are densest in communities that can afford those services. So communities of color in many cases are left behind in terms of uh, an array of mental and behavioral health services. So whatever the federal government can do uh, 
uh, uh, uh, needs to uh, uh, needs to be done. Subsidizing the cost of services, particularly for low-income communities, as I indicated uh, earlier. Uh, subsidizing the training of future mental health professionals who want to work in underserved communities, I think, is critically important. We have federal programs that have been very successful um, in helping to uh, incentivize providers to get into communities where they're desperately needed. We need to expand those programs because uh, <clears throat> we don't have enough providers in communities uh, where uh, demand is high. But always these uh, services need to be community engaged and informed. Uh, and I think that's an area where our mental health professional associations um, can go a long way in terms of training our, our constituents about how to be community engaged, community informed, uh, understanding sources of resiliency that already exist in communities. Uh, the Black church, so many other sources of resiliency that are understudied, underfunded, uh, that are implicitly part of our health and mental health care infrastructure uh, that we need to be supporting. Um, our corporate community needs to step up and support uh, that kind of infrastructure. Uh, so our, our mental health infrastructure is currently malaligned. Communities with the greatest need get the least infrastructure, uh, and we need support to help fill in that gap. Great points. Dr. Shepard? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was being caught up reading some of the questions that uh, people are, are, are asking. Um, there is a statement uh, that is at the end of the report uh, that says the policy of the United States is to bring the Negro American to full and equal sharing in the responsibilities and rewards of citizenship. Wow. Um, you know, it, it, Moyahan was referring to how the president uh, has committed the nation to an all-out effort to eliminate poverty wherever it exists among whites and Negroes and a militant, organized, and responsible Negro movement exists to join in that effort. Such a national effort should be stated thus, what I just stated. And uh, so what, what I would do uh, would just uh, echo what Dr. Smetley just said and just wrap it up in a nice bow and just say, the policy of the United States is to bring the Black American to full and equal sharing in responsibilities and rewards of citizenship. Um, I, unfortunately, in the number of years I've lived here in the United States, and this is the only place, country I've ever lived in, I have never felt that I've had the full benefit of being a citizen of this country. Now, that's a sad statement. Um, but, and I can honestly say that because I, again, it, it does, it, it, it kind of wells you up with emotion, to be honest with you, because you think about the, um, the, the various things that you've suffered, um, and that my grandparents suffered and those who went on before me that, uh, you know, you didn't expect to have to still deal with the same stuff even on the same level, just in a different format, you know, that, that they dealt with. And whatever policies that we need to implement, and APA should be right behind them to endorse, uh, to be able to enhance, to make sure that they're going to happen. But we want to make sure that people are being treated right. Uh, and I know I'm talking in broad terms. Let's just start uh, and I'll just give one example and I'm done, Dr. Wilson. Loans, loan forgiveness. I mean, let's look at that. I mean, a lot of Black people are not able to get educated because, number one, they can't send their children to school. When, if they do get to school, they have to take out loans. They can't pay back the loans because of various different reasons why. Um, the financial burden and the weight of people uh, of what people carry uh, is such a uh, such a obstacle, such a roadblock. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, and I'm not here to talk politics, uh, but I can understand why President Biden is uh, 
you know, bent on trying to reduce some of that because he knows and understands, or at least someone in his office understands that if to have that financial freedom allows for you to be able to overcome. So, so we really have got to echo everything that Dr. Smithley said. I don't have to go back through that, but we got to make sure that we're making this a place where a uh, person such as myself, I feel and I have the rights of full citizenship in this country. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more, especially when it comes to, you know, directly what do we need to be doing from a policy perspective to impact psychiatric care? You know, things like you all mentioned, you know, the programs in underserved communities, National Health Service Corps. Um, I'm happy to be a Nat National Health Service Corps scholar. That's how I got to Northern Kentucky, right? And, and you know, they paid for medical school and I'm here serving, serving the underserved population. I know many of us um, are doing that. And so I, I think that's a direct way where we talk about repairing, right? This is, this is how policy repairs what happened. You put funding and you put resources into those communities, and that's one way of doing it, in addition to, other, to some of the other uh, things that you all mentioned. And so um, I appreciate that. And so, um, so I think we're, we're, the timing is good. We, at about 7.50, we'll be going to, to audience questions. So I think we have one more um, a time for our last question here, which was scheduled for, for the panelists. And so again, you know, for those who have questions in the audience, feel free to put them in the chat. And so future visions, and I'll come to you uh, first on this, Dr. Shepard, to, to close out the panelist discussion. Looking forward, how can mental health professionals use the lessons from the Moynihan Report to create more inclusive and effective mental health care frameworks? Yeah, um, you know, it's... It's one of those things where I look at uh, a a term that I I kind of stole from somebody else, uh, trendy versus transformational. Um, we as psychiatrists living today have got to be transformational in our practices and not trendy. What do I mean by that? There's going to be so many different things that have come up and, you know, I'm not necessarily old, but I've seen it in my, you know, a decade of practice, a little, little bit more than a decade of practice now. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and I've learned some things that I just can't allow society to dictate to me how I'm going to practice medicine. If I'm going to be one who is respected, one who is heard, and one who people will come back to. I've got to be able to define the various principles that I stand on and be transformational in those uh, areas. So, so, so what does that mean, Shepard, when you say transformational? That means that um, I just can't change every time an APA president decides to flip the switch or this action paper comes out. No, I must stand for what I know is right. What does that mean? That means that uh, if I see that uh, we have one year more SAMHSA fellows uh, who are being um, supported and then 10 years down the line, there is no funding for that. Transformation tells me, no, what, what happened there? We need to figure out how do we maintain those type of programs? How do we make sure that our far reach goes more than just, well, it was good for this because it's anti, I'm sorry, it's, it's, D, it's DEI, but now let's see, oh my God, it's anti-DEI now because the Supreme Court said that we can't have uh, 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 biases toward Black people, as they say. You know, so now we know we have this whole DEI did not earn it. My my God, let me tell you, if I am transformational, if I'm a transformational psychiatrist, that means that I'm going to stand on what I know to be right as far as equity, to make sure that I'm reaching back, to make sure I'm reaching forward, to make sure I don't care what policies may come and go, that I need to know what principles I stand on. And I say me because my principles may be different from yours out there, which is fine, totally fine. I'm not even getting into that. That's not this type of discussion for today, but at least stand for something. So when you talk about an effective framework, you need to find an organization, find a group of people 
who you believe in and support it and make sure that that is an effective framework for the ideals that you believe in. So it would be uh, stupid for me to try to give a whole framework, Dr. Wilson, but that's where, you know, I want to hang my answer on. I encourage and I challenge everybody out there, do not be trendy. Make sure you know why you're practicing and make sure you're practicing the area and make sure you're happy. I'll say this. I really am done. There's so many people out here practicing psychiatry who are unhappy and you need to go sit down because you're not helping us. We, you need to go find a place where you're going to be happy, be transformational, make a difference. You don't have to see 100 people in, in a week. No, but do what you do and do it well. That's how you create an effective mental health framework. And if you do your part, we work together, we'll do better. Absolutely. That's powerful. That's powerful. And so, uh, Dr. Smelly. I just want to, again, just endorse what Dr. Sepper just said, because that's that's critically important. Um, you know, the APA is such a powerful voice, and you have leveraged your uh, voice in, in for, for justice. Racial equity is one of those transformational issues that is a a long haul issue. You can't be in it for the short haul. We saw a lot of uh, commitments that were made in the wake of the tragic murder of George Floyd in 2020 wither away uh, within a year or two. So to be transformational in this space is to be clear how racism impacts uh, mental health and impacts the mental health and well being of communities we care about, which is truly every community but particularly those most marginalized and those that because of structural inequities in terms of how we uh, finance and deliver mental health care are in the short end of the stick. Uh, so uh, we need to use every opportunity to advocate for their needs, uh, particularly in the wake of COVID and the lessons COVID taught us about uh, the crumbling mental health infrastructure in this country. Absolutely. Um, as I have been doing the entire time, I'm going to piggyback and then just emphasize something you've already said. People who go to underserved communities need to be motivated and, and pleased to be there. And one of the things, obviously, that we know from the research is that when we, you know, one, many of us in our underserved communities, our, our constituencies, you know, they, they come to care late because of all the barriers. But once they get to care, uh, it's poor quality care. And part of that, I think, is because um, there are providers among us, and it's not to just come down on psychiatrists, but we have to hold each other accountable. There are providers among us who um, I believe they, you know, some, some may believe that they are doing our communities a favor, right? And it's not about doing us a favor to be in our communities, to work in our communities. Um, it's a privilege. And so I think, um, you know, it, having that attitude is important uh, to put your best, you know, face forward, whether you're a psychologist doing therapy or you're uh, psychiatrists with medication management. Um, I think we need to be uh, happy and motivated to be in our communities to make up for some of the things that that Moynihan uh, identified decades ago. And so, um, okay. And so, what we'll do is we'll we'll bring. You know, I appreciate the, you know, Doctor both Doctor Smelly and Doctor Shepard for for taking those very very challenging questions. Um, and I look forward to more challenging questions from from our audience. And uh, so we'll we'll transition to the question and answer period. And again, as I'm as I'm reading through some of the first ones that have come in, uh, feel free to, to bring in some others. And so um, I will start with, let's pull this up here. Let's see. Oh, there we go. All right. And so first question uh, from Dr. Shaner was uh, the Let's see. The APA passed the resolution below in January, February, March, April, May, May 2023. Do you agree that these actions by the APA are warranted? And then first, and I'll read through it. Yeah. Be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the American Psychiatric Association will issue a statement on the APA website, as well as publications in the editorials of the American Journal of Psychiatry and Psychiatric News that acknowledges the fallacies of the Moynihan Report and its multi-generational negative impact upon Black mental health. It's the first part. Second, repudiates all misguided psychotherapeutic theory and practices based upon it, 
primarily the fallacy of tangle of pathologies as being direct consequences of dysfunctional family structure. And then three, that the APA consider drafting a position statement on this topic. And so thank you for your question, Dr. Shainer. And so who would like to take first cracks at that? I know it has a couple of different pieces. And so let's do, how about the first part? And we'll go through each one. Board of Trustees, issue a statement on the APA website, as well as publications in the editorials of the American Journal of Psychiatry and Psych News that acknowledges the fallacies, first, acknowledges the fallacies of the Morning Hair Report and its multi-generational negative impact upon Black mental health. What do our panelists think about that? I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with, with all of it. Um, I have a point afterwards, though, but it, it's... Yeah, you can publicize and you can write a paper. My, my issue, I want to see your behavior. Don't write nothing if your behavior not going to change. Uh, and so those, so I, I happen to be the president of the Black Caucus. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I just be transparent it might get me in trouble. That's fine. But one of the reasons why you don't see me do a lot of action papers, I, I work with those who do action papers uh, because... I just don't see the strength behind action papers. I see strength when when behaviors change. And as child and psychiatrist, which I am, and for people uh, as adult in particular, um, that's what I know that you actually are ready to make a shift is when your behavior has changed. So, I, I hey, I love to read it in black and white, but there's so many other stuff that was in black and white. Let's look at Starbucks, okay? Trendy versus transformational. These are the same people who closed all their stores across the country when they kicked two black men out. But then they got mad when their own employees wore Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Do you all remember that? Do you all know that? That is, well, I'm not going to use a psychiatric term. You know, now, layman's term said that's bipolar, but all right, we know better than that. But that doesn't make sense. How are you gonna be over here one 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 week and then over here next? So as APA, we have to make sure that if we're gonna write something, that we're ready to back it up and we're able to show it. Agree, agree. And any other thoughts on that? What about the the comment around uh, the tangle of pathologies and? repudiating that, and then you, you you all kind of touched on the position statement part. I, I'll talk about that as well. Is there Was there any comment on a tangle of pathologies that Moynihan brought up, and how should that be addressed? I mean, I think that's what we've been talking about uh, most of the evening, that this is uh, this is mythology more than science, So, uh, and it's, it's had harmful consequences. So I'm glad to see the intent behind the statement, but I agree with Dr. Shepard. There has to be some action uh, behind the intent. I agree, and I and I and I'll add my two cents on on uh, the position statement part, um, because the one you know this is something that actually came to our council right as the as the chairperson of the council on minority mental health and health disparities, you know this action paper you know came came to our council, um, and our you know we discussed it, and our our solid belief was very similar to kind of Dr. Shepard's position. Um, one, that may be a position statement, you know, we didn't think that a position statement was the right way to go about it simply because I don't think you get to really attack the nuances of uh, the actual report itself. And then we would have to be figuring out what are we repudiating? What are we not repudiating? Because I, you know, again, you know, Dr. Shepard has mentioned, you know, being very strong potentially with, with unpopular opinions. And I'm, I think I'm very strong with potentially unpopular opinions as well, which is, I don't think you can throw everything out in the morning hair report. I simply don't. I think that there are points that he made that resonated with me strongly. And then there are points that he made that I wanted to, to throw something at my tablet, right? And so I think, um, you know, so when we talk about, I mean, he mentioned, obviously we talked about him, him missing the entire boat when it comes to um, his uh, kind of conceptualization of the matriarchy and it should be a patriarchy. and you know, that's not how a Black community operates. And we have very healthy examples of matriarchies. Um, but when it comes to him openly stating, 
you know, American slavery was the worst slavery the world has ever known. I agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, we can't expect the, back, the black community in 1965 to simply be given opportunities without some measure of equalizing outcomes because we destroyed them for 200, you know, 200 years. I agreed with that. And so, um, so I, I, I personally don't think that a position statement from the APA would be as useful. One, because uh, something that Dr. Shepard said, which is I, I think actions are more, um, are more important. Now we can argue that position statements potentially can lead to action. And that's why action papers are called action papers. But um, at the same time, I just think it, I think it gets lost in the shuffle of, a, you know, just kind of stashed on our website to never be seen again. Whereas at least when we're talking about it here, um, which, which I'm very happy we're doing, we can direct uh, some of our comments to the APA, to, you know, outside, you know, as far as policy and things that we recommend, I think it's a more powerful way to do that. Um, not wrong, it's just, I think that, you know, there's there's just more nuanced ways uh, to uh, to address what's in the morning hair report without throwing everything away and being nuanced enough to, to acknowledge that there are some things that uh, that are in there, you know, job creation and all those types of things that I think are, are very relevant to us today. But that's a, that's a great question, Dr. Shane. All right, and moving right along. All right, next question we have is from uh, Johanna Paulino Woolridge. Uh, how has the effects of this report affected research practices and advances in psychiatry concerning minority mental health? That's a great question. Again, how has the effects of this report affected research practices and advances in psychiatry concerning minority mental health. And I know Dr. Smith, you touched a little bit on research and where we need to go. And based on Moynihan report, do you, do you want to? Sure. I think the Moynihan report um, reinforced a narrow scientific perspective. The, it, again, when you pose the questions posed in the Moynihan report, when you interpret your data through the kind of racist kind of patriarchal lens that was prevalent throughout society and, and continues to be prevalent throughout society, you get answers that reflect that um, perspective. And so, um, you know, trying to decolonize our, our scientific approaches, uh, what do I mean by that? Simply respecting the way other ways of knowledge production, other forms of, of knowing from other cultures, other societies, indigenous knowledge, uh, not privileging uh, Western approaches to science, uh, privileging particular methods that um, may not reflect the traditions of knowledge production in other communities. So um, it, to me, it's exciting to see efforts to kind of decolonize the way that our science is produced, how this research is, is published. Uh, you know, it, it still is in its infancy in terms of how we understand um uh these forces in the u.s context uh but we got we have to and we're beginning to understand um that the kinds of research questions that we've asked reflect uh a white racist supremacist patriarchal system which is the context in which moynihan was operating and that probably persisted for generations influencing research for decades after Dr. Shepard, the floor is yours. If you have anything to add, no, I think that that was a sufficient answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I'll follow up with with uh, Paul, uh, Joanna Paulina Woodridge. Uh, she also had a, a response to that. And great point. The research was conducted under misunderstanding about cultures, beliefs, morals, family structure, and priorities are not aligned with majority culture at the time. So speaking to what Dr. Smelly mentioned, so absolutely. All right, and then, uh, so Constance Dunlap also has a question. How are you doing, Dr. Dunlap? Uh, so thank you for hosting this informative educational panel. The assembly passed the action paper uh, that was mentioned above. Uh, can the panelists comment on why the APA should draft and post an official position statement repudiating this report? I think we kind of touched on that. Was there, was there anything else that uh, panelists wanted to, to discuss on that one? Okay. That's a great, great question, Dr. Dunn. Hopefully the, the answer we had above uh, kind of uh, fulfilled that. Uh, Cynthia Turner-Graham, how are you doing, Dr. Turner-Graham? Uh, to fully understand the depth and impact of the Moynihan Report, 
the report of the 1968 Kerner Commission report on civil disorder needs at least a cursory mention. It also has implications on current perceptions and cultural sensitivity within mental health care delivery systems. And, and thank you for that. Is anyone aware of the 1968 Kerner Commission report on civil disorder? Can anyone speak to that? Well, the, the questioner is correct that in that this report was commissioned in the wake of civil disturbance happening across the country, Los Angeles, Detroit. I was there as a child in 1968 when smoke filled the air. And, um, you know, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's been a, a long time since I've read the Kerner report, but unfortunately, these, these reports, again, are in the context of the period and through the lens of those that wrote them. Uh, you know, white men that were trying to, um, you know, may have been sincere in their efforts, but um, lacks a historical context and lacks a deeper understanding of, of uh, political and economic injustice that was uh, behind the civil disturbance um, and so many other, uh, and of course, Moynihan itself. Absolutely. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Shepard? Uh, no, I was actually, as uh, as you all were talking, I was I was looking up the the commission report. Uh, I I do agree that uh, we have so many different reports that come out, um, and they really are based upon what is happening in that in that time and place. Uh, that 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 sliver of the pie, if you would, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, but it still goes back to my point that you can have these reports uh, for numerous years, dating back numerous years, and it's so fascinating that you get the same results ultimately. Uh, the mindsets don't change. It's just the, the actors have changed or the circumstances. But the thread, the main themes uh, keep coming through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's see, looks like we got two more questions that's not in here. I definitely want to get them if we can. Let's see. Uh, Johanna Paulina Woodridge. Uh, it's interesting that similar comments could be said about the Black Lives Matter movement in just recent years. Great point. Great point. Um, and then uh, Dr. Turner Graham, there were attributions made and responsibilities assigned to white nationalism, identified two separate countries in the U.S. and that ghettos were created by white society. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And so um, as we're coming down, I want to be mindful of time. We actually got some, some good time here. I'll take two minutes to just have some key takeaways. And then uh, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Smedley and Dr. Shepard just uh, about two and a half minutes each just to kind of their, their closing remarks. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there was so much that was discussed today, obviously. And um, but a few uh, key takeaways I, I, I was able to jot down is, uh, you know, Dr. Smedley made some great points around uh, policies that need to invest in communities of color, right? That's that's really how we repair. That's how we move. That's one of the ways that we can move forward. Uh, we need to be focusing on sending the funding, sending the um, the legislative attention toward communities of color that have been disadvantaged, like Moynihan identifies. Um, but it's not enough to just recognize that there needs to be something that we're doing. Uh, Dr. Shepard, of course, talked about focusing on trauma. You know, not just individual trauma, not just family trauma. But what we're talking about here is, is centuries of generational trauma, right? And what does that mean to us in 2024 as we're sitting with, uh, with patients in our offices? Um, how, do we, how do we discuss that? What language do we use? What trauma-informed language do we use? How do we even set up uh, treatment plans that address that? And that's something that I think as mental health professionals, and the beauty of this is that we have a psychologist and, a, and, a psych and psychiatry all in the same panel, um, knowing that we, we work together on these things, right? We, we work collaborative, collaboratively uh, to be able to, to, to manage these things, but how do we set a framework up for trauma? Um, and, you know, this just generally speaking again about the Moynihan Report, I think it was groundbreaking for its time. It was, it was controversial uh, as it should have been with some of the things that were in there. Um, it was right on the money with other things that was in there. And, and we have to look at it also as a document of its time. Um, because what's actually true um, is Moynihan was definitely uh, uh, 
attack for his thoughts, right? And attack for his positions and, uh, you know, and questions and challenge like he should have been. Um, but it's interesting that he was actually challenged from both sides. The, the African-American community and advocates of our community uh, were definitely uh, concerned about his focus on family structure, while also individuals in his own party, as well as uh, individuals in other political spheres, attacked him for even mentioning that uh, what was going on with the Black community at that time was a result of uh, racism. And he was, the, he was actually one of the first people, particularly first people in government, to acknowledge that. Uh, that what's going on with the black community is definitely a legacy of slavery, a legacy of sharecropping and all those horrible things that, as, as Dr. Shepard mentioned, to our to our community apart, um, that we're still trying to repair and, and you know, we're, we're resilient as we do that. And so, um, so I will go to uh, Dr. Smedley first, just to, to give his uh, a couple of minutes on his, his closing remarks, and then we'll come to you, Dr. Shepard. And so Dr. Smedley, floor is yours, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Well, thank you, Dr. Wilson. I, I want to, again, thank the APA for having this important conversation. Uh, this kind of forum, this opportunity to learn from each other is so key to our solution, to our ability to, to, to deal with these difficult challenges. Let me just cor correct one thing at the outset. I'm, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, never licensed, not talented enough. No, just kidding. I've been inv involved in policy and research in health equity for 30 plus years. So, uh, but I deeply appreciate my, my training as a psychologist because uh, ultimately uh, we are about trying to understand social forces. Uh, I worked briefly at the other APA, the American Psychological Association, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, in my capacity as Chief of Public Interest Policy, uh, to help the APA, that the other APA, in crafting their resolution, uh, apologizing for the discipline's uh, racist uh, actions, but also trying to prescribe a path going forward. Uh, the psychologists, of course, were, were deeply complicit in eugenicist movements, uh, doing harmful things like promoting fallacious uh, intelligence testing that did nothing but reify uh, their racial white supremacist worldview. Uh, but what that resolution does is it offers um, a prescription for the discipline going forward to begin to think about and reflect on how racism and the belief in white supremacy has infected scientific methods, teaching methods, training, uh, supervision, uh, hierarchies within the discipline. The discipline needs to be cleansed of that kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of very harmful notions. Uh, and so that resolution uh, offered a series of recommendations that might be instructive for you, you the other APA, uh, in terms of uh, thinking about how to interrogate um, clinical training, uh, uh, research, um, and other uh, ways of knowledge production for their potential to re reinforce racist beliefs. Thank you again for having this convening. Thank you, Dr. Smelly. All right, and thank you, Dr. Smelly. It was great to work with you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And I want to give a shout out to the people out there, uh, Dr. Cynthia Turner Graham, who was former BPA, Black Psychiatrist of America president, and Constance Dunlap, who we worked together in DC, uh, Area 3 trustee, if I'm not mistaken. And there's some other people out there. I saw Alicia Barnes. So I was just, I got I got a whole host of people out there that I just want to give a quick shout out to. Uh, those who've heard me talk know that uh, somehow way I'm going to have to fit it in, PCWC. What does that stand for? Potential Cult Work and Contribution or Community. Contri uh, 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 community or Contribution to Your Community. What does that mean? This is the definition of mental health. What we've been talking about today is a state of well-being where every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work effectively and productively, and then make a contribution to his or her community. That is the definition of mental health, according to the World Health Organization. I just shepherdized it and made a PCWC so that you all will remember it. And that 
let me tell you, I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care what webinar you're a part of. It's all going to come back down to do people understand their potential? Can they cope? Do they know how to work? And what, what are they doing for their community? And I don't care if you're looking at this report. This report definitely uh, does not live up to being able to uh, to know the full potential of Black people. Uh, uh, yeah, it don't really understand how we cope. And we definitely working better than what it's saying. And the contribution it made, mm -hmm. but I just want to tell you is that we want you to know that the APA, those who are working with us, want you to be able to live and live so that your PCWC is 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 is, is in tip top shape as, as best as possible. And then the last point is don't be trendy. Let's be transformational. And let's make sure that uh, the work that we're doing is the work that uh, we uh, went to school to do uh, and that we're not just doing something because uh, it felt like the right thing to do uh, or APA made me do it. Or uh, <laughs> let's, let's make sure that we're doing it because this is our work and that we really care about it. And I really think the people on this particular panel and who's in the audience are very passionate. So those are my parting words to you. Uh, thank you all again. I enjoyed this time. Absolutely. So couldn't have said it better myself. Again, Dr. Smedley, Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for, for such a great conversation. The, the beautiful part is this is just the beginning, right? These type of panel sessions are just the beginning of, of taking some action, right? And I definitely want to thank the APA, uh, Dr. James, Gabriel, uh, Fatima for, for putting this on and, and for everyone for sticking around with us. And so uh, we won't hold you any longer, but again, the, the discussion has just started regarding this. And so appreciate it. Thank you and have a great night, everyone.